Seeds come in many shapes and sizes, and with many ingenious mechanisms for their dispersal. Some seeds are so small you need a microscope to see them, like the seed of the coral root orchid in the bottom right here. The largest seed in the world is the coco de mer, which is as big as an adult human's butt and even shaped like a butt. I have happy memories of giggling at this seed on display at the Botanic Gardens in London that we'd visit once a year when we were staying with my grandparents. In between these two extremes are seeds of many sizes and many shapes, including the very average looking bladder pod that you can see in the photo here. In terms of the genetic diversity of a population of plants and competition for resources, it's advantageous for seeds to be dispersed some distance away from their mother plant, and seeds have various mechanisms for achieving this. Some seeds have appendages that help their dispersal. For example, the fluffy pappus of many plants in the sunflower family, and the helicopter-like wings on the seeds of maples. Other seeds, like the California beech burr, have spines that cling to the fur of passing mammals, and the bare feet of humans. They really hurt. Some grasses, like our California state grass, purple needle grass, Stipa pulchra, pictured here with its close relative Stipa cernua, have long whiskery awns and short bristly hairs that cling like Velcro to passing mammals. As you learned in the unit on pollination and fertilization, some seeds are surrounded by soft fleshy tissue formed from the mature swollen ovary. The ecological purpose of this soft tissue isn't to protect the seed, it's to help in the seed's dispersal. In the wild, this soft fleshy tissue can be an important food source for many birds and other animals who eat these fruits and unwittingly disperse the indigestible seed by pooping it out, often at considerable distances from the mother plant. Regardless of their size, shape or dispersal method, most seeds share a similar internal structure and all seeds share similar environmental needs in order to germinate. They all need appropriate amounts of water and oxygen and the right temperature range, and we'll come back to these in another unit. Seeds are the product of the double fertilization process you learned about in an earlier unit. They're ovules that have matured and are surrounded by a protective seed coat called the testa, which protects the seed from complete desiccation and mechanical damage. On the right here, you can see a diagram of the typical structure of dicot seeds. The testa surrounds and protects a plant embryo, which consists of a plumule, which is an embryonic shoot, and a radical, which is an embryonic root. Most seeds, except for extremely small ones, contain a store of carbohydrate, which provides energy for germinating seedlings until they emerge above ground and can start producing their own energy through photosynthesis. In the dicots, much of the carbohydrate is stored in a pair of fleshy cotyledons, which are embryonic leaves, and the first leaves that you see when the seedling emerges above ground. These fleshy leaves in many larger seeds, such as peas, beans, lupins and acorns, are a favourite food source for weevils that chew their way into the seed to feast on the cotyledons. Some weevils also lay their eggs in the seed, so that their larvae have a plentiful food source when they hatch. If the larvae damage the embryo, the seed usually won't germinate. The micropyle is a small opening in the tester, which gave the pollen tube access to the ovule at the beginning of the fertilization process. As the seed matures, the micropyle is sealed, but before this happens, the micropyle can be the point of entry for seed-borne viruses. The seed also, of course, contains DNA, which controls the process of germination and emergence. Monocot seeds are very similar to dicot seeds, except they have just a single cotyledon, not two, hence the name monocot, and their carbohydrate energy reserve is stored as endosperm. It's not stored in the cotyledon. In grains like wheat, the endosperm is what humans grind up to make flour. In both monocots and dicots, if the mother plant becomes stressed, especially drought stressed, while the seed's developing, it's possible that insufficient carbohydrate will be laid down in the seed. Assuming the seed has enough energy to even germinate, there may not be enough carbohydrate for the seedling to emerge above ground, 
or if it does, the seedling may be weak. This is something you need to be aware of if you're collecting seed from plants in the wild or from plants in a cultivated landscape that are drought stressed, as it may be a cause of you having low emergence percentages or reduced survival rates of seedlings. Usually you'd be able to spot the underdeveloped seeds and reject them before sowing them. In the photo, you can see three pods of yellow bush lupin seeds. The dark brown, almost black seeds are plump and really well developed. I know it's not easy to see in the photo, especially if you're not familiar with this plant or its seed, but the pale seeds there are thin and underdeveloped. This may have been caused by drought stress after fertilization had taken place, or drought st stress may have resulted in fertilization being incomplete and the seed not developing normally. You'd just be wasting your time and resources if you sowed these small thin seeds. Poorly developed seed isn't just a problem for propagators. There can also be ecological consequences in natural landscapes. Lower germination and emergence can result in a reduction in plant population numbers, especially if the period of stress is prolonged. And of course, it results in fewer food sources for the animals that depend on these seeds. So on that happy note, this is the end of this lecture. Head back to Canvas now to continue with this unit.